Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Connecting Point. Good morning to those that are watching from home today. Good morning to all of you. What an amazing day today as we celebrate a hundred years. Many of you have maybe heard me say this before, but the average lifespan of a church is 70 years. And God has done amazing things. We are 30 years beyond that, and God is still giving us vision because of you and what God's doing through you. And so we say a big thank you today. We've got a special day planned. As I mentioned earlier, we have several different people who, are, who have influenced our church and our denomination, and they're here today. One of those is Dr. David Graves, who is one of our general superintendents. Our denomination has six general superintendents that basically see the globe for our denomination, and he is graciously here this morning. He was planning to be with us tonight, but obviously with the weather, he's here this morning. And so let's welcome uh, Pastor David Graves as he comes this morning. So good to have you. Thank you, Pastor. It is a privilege to be here on behalf of the Board of General Superintendents and uh, present this special plaque to you I guess it's a plaque, it's a, <laughs> but it's a century of faithful ministry for the Pittsburgh church. In recognition of a century of faithful ministry, the Board of General Superintendents congratulates the Pittsburgh Church of the Nazarene. Amen. We commend you for carrying out Christ's mission of discipling Christians, supporting missions both at home and abroad, and proclaiming the message of holiness. And we congratulate you, you, Pastor, and congratulate all of you. For all you've done. And we do want to congratulate you. 100 years. Wow, that's a long time. I don't think any of you were here in the very beginning, were you? If you were, you were very young and you're very old right now. But we are glad and so thankful for all that this church has done down through the years. We're so thankful for the faithful ministry of pastors who have served here faithfully down through the years. And thank God for all of the children's workers and the youth sponsors and the Sunday school teachers and the musicians. (laughs) And for all the members who have sacrificed and prayed and devoted themselves to the building of God's kingdom. We are thankful for them in the past, but we're also thankful for you today and what you continue to do for God's glory and for the building of his kingdom. I'm also thankful for, think about this, for the multitude of people's lives that have been changed down through the years through the ministry of this church. Lives that have been changed, homes that have been saved, generations that have been impacted by the ministries of this church. We're also thankful for your faithfulness as a church down through the years and supporting the World Evangelism Fund and mission specials. In today's equivalency, you ready for this? You as a church, in today's equivalency, down through the 100 years, have given over $2.2 million for the building of God's kingdom around the world. And now as a church of the Nazarene, we're in 163 different world countries. And I'll tell you a little secret. We're actually in more than that. We just can't officially report it. But 163 official world areas. And now the church of the Nazarene, what it was 100 years ago compared to what it is now with over 30,000 local congregations and 2.6, over 2.6 million members God is truly using churches just like you, not only to build the kingdom right here and in Columbus, but also to build God's kingdom around the world. And we are so thankful for you. And today we celebrate with you these 100 years of faithful ministry. But today I'd also like to not only celebrate with you, but I'd also like to challenge you challenge you to embrace the present reality of where you are as a church. And to be honest with you, churches all around the world and churches like you, we're facing many problems today, many challenges with Satan's attacks on the church, with the pressure of our culture that is trying to squish our witness and 
put us down and we think about all of the unrest that is going on in our country today and with all of that on top of that the COVID-19 virus with social distancing and wearing those don't you just love those masks <laughs> I tried to preach one time in one of those I almost passed out <laughs> I kept sucking it in my mouth and blowing it back it's terrible I glasses were fogging up with masks and all of washing your hands and the health regulations. Wow, what a challenge for the church today. And then you add on top of that the uncertainty of our economy. Truly, we are facing some challenges as a church, aren't we? But I have good news for you today. I want you to know that even in these days, even in the days in which we find ourselves living today, we can still praise God. Amen? Because we are still serving a God who is still on the throne. He is still reigning. He is still ruling. We still serve a God who hears and answers prayer. We still serve a God who knows you by name and knows where you are and knows what you're going through. And we serve a God who is able to meet all of our needs. Amen. We still serve a miracle working God. And so even in spite of everything else, we can rejoice today and we can praise God that today for your hundredth year, we're not observing the death of a church. We are observing a church that are seeing the best days in the hundred years of a Dunham as a local congregation. We're still, being, still serving a God who said the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. And God is helping his church. And he's helping you as a church to continue to share the good news with people all around this area. To win new people to Jesus Christ. To transform families and marriages and to build his kingdom. And today we have a whole lot to celebrate. Amen. But I also want to challenge you to embrace not on your present, but I want to challenge you that in these days to experience like never before his presence. We sang that first song. You know what that first song was talking about? The Exodus and out of Egypt and all of that. Well, we read about that over in Exodus and read about how God sent Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let his people go. And, and how God delivered them and how Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they came right up to the bank of the Red Sea. They had a great obstacle in front of them. And guess what was happening behind them? Not only was the Red Sea in front of them, but behind them was Pharaoh and his mighty army coming to take them back to Egypt. And not only was he... The, Pharaoh coming but on each side they were surrounded by mountains and in that situation Moses gives us some instructions today as we celebrate and notice what he says in Exodus chapter 14 he says first of all do not be afraid and I'd say to you today don't be afraid we're still serving a God who is alive and well, and this is his church, and we are his people, and he will not let us down. He will never fail us. So I would say to you, no matter what you're experiencing, take heart. He's still alive. Not only does he say take heart, but he also says stand firm. And I would challenge you, pastor, and I challenge you as a church, stand firm in your commitments Stand firm in your commitment to being his church. Stand firm in your commitment to fulfill the mission and the vision that God has given you as a local congregation. Stay, take, stay committed to evangelism, winning people. Stay, stay committed to discipleship. Stay committed to preaching and teaching the message of holiness and letting people know that they can be not only forgiven of their past sins, but they can be set free from the power and the bondage of sin in their present life. Amen. And today, more than ever before, I, I'm convinced of this. Today, more than ever before, we as a church need to stand firm in who we are 
in what we believe. And we cannot afford to relax. We cannot afford to back up. We need to stay committed to what God has called us to do and be strengthen our commitments. But then notice what he says, third thing. He says, see the salvation of God. Isn't that great? Even with all of these obstacles go around, he says, see the salvation of God. Do any of you know what this day is on the, on the Jewish calendar? Anybody know? This is the Day of Atonement. You know what the Day of Atonement was? In the Jewish religion, the Day of Atonement was that one day a year where the high priest would go into the holies of holies, and there he would make sacrifice for the sins of the people. And they would be purified, and they would be cleansed, and they would be forgiven of their sins. Well, my friends, I've got good news for you. We don't have to wait to one day a year. We can experience that freedom. We can experience that forgiveness. We can experience that purity that he gives to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We can experience it each and every day of our lives. Aren't you thankful for that? And there might be some of you here today that you've never personally experienced that. There might be some of you watching on the internet, some of you in another location, that you've never taken advantage of what Jesus Christ did for you on Calvary's cross. Well, today is your day. What a day, a day of atonement to do that, to experience that, to just simply say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I open up my heart and life. I invite you to come and live in my life. And if you do that, he promises that he'll come. And he'll forgive you. And you'll become a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. If you've never done that, I encourage you to do that on this day. A day where we're celebrating his faithfulness and his goodness for 100 years. But also on the day of atonement. And I pray, Pastor, that you as a local congregation will continue to experience that week after week after week in the lives of your children, in the lives of your youth, in the lives of your young adults, that you will experience in your families and in our neighbors and in our friends, that this would be a place where God sets people free. But he also says, remember this. That the Lord will go with you. The Lord will fight the battles that we sang about. The Lord will fight the battles for us. So let's get moving. Now can you imagine what that must have sounded like to Moses when God said, get moving. Oh, well, wait a minute, God. <clears throat> There's a sea here in front of me. There's Pharaoh behind me. And there are mountains on both sides of me. What, where do you suggest I get moving to? And he said, Moses, you just get moving. And notice what happens. That when Moses and the children of Israel stepped out in faith, God moved out in power. And he opened up the Red Sea and they crossed on dry ground. And he's saying to us as a church, he's saying, hey, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the past. Let's celebrate God's faithfulness, his provision, and his grace. Let's embrace the challenges that we're facing today with faith and confidence in the goodness and greatness of our God. But also let's experience this miracle-working God right here today as we envision the wonderful future that he has for us. As we step out in faith, he will move out in force to fulfill all the dreams and the vision that he has for this church. We congratulate you, not only in your past, but boy, I'm excited about today and I'm excited about your future as you join up with this God who moves mountains and opens seas and makes a way into a good and promised land. God bless you all. Amen. Dr. Graves, you got me fired up. What an exciting, you should give a halftime locker room speech. Everybody's ready to go here. What an amazing beginning to this morning. 
Um, many of you know Dr. Or Phil Rhodes, our district superintendent in Columbus. Uh, some of you have heard me tell this story before, but Phil had came to me and mentioned, hey, I want you to pray about starting a church in Columbus. And I said, I can pray about that, but I don't think that's going to happen. We've got one couple from this church that is from Columbus, but I'll pray about it. And the Lord basically said, you need to listen to what Phil said. That's what's going to happen. We sent 37 people. You know, it's not about numbers, but every number has a name, and every number ha- name has a face, and every face matters to God. We sent 37 people, and we've seen well over 100 people at that church, and we had 22 people that have been saved over there, and we've got two more. Sean's telling me we're up to 24 people over there. So God's been doing some great things, and Phil's been instrumental on our district and leading more and more churches being planted, as well as just uh, just doing a great job. So let's welcome Phil Rhodes as he comes and shares with us. Kyle is way too kind on that in case you didn't hear that. Is Izzy, is she still in the room someplace? Come here, girlfriend. Yeah, up here. Come on. This is what joy looks like. And, and, and I don't care if the, if the band was really bad on any given Sunday. I wouldn't be watching or listening. I'd be watching the brand new drummer for Pitt Naz. Because she's got Jesus all wrapped up right here. And she is wonderful. And you are a lucky church to have her. All right, so thank you, sweetheart. What a joy to just to have people like that, man. And you've had them for a hundred years. And then I'm lucky today. My favorite wife is with me today. <laughs> she puts up with more nonsense than, than is legal. And so, uh, if you get a chance, just come up to her, pat her on the shoulder. And just say, in southern terms, bless your heart. <laughs> and, and if you're from the south, you'll understand what that means. From you northerners, you're, you're just going, what does that mean? Ask a southerner, they'll tell you. A hundred years ago, a small group of people met with a dream. They had no idea that 100 years later, we would honor them for believing in the impossible. It seems like God is in the business of doing the impossible. He has the ability to take an ordinary piece of land and turn it into holy ground. He has the ability to take a group of ordinary people with a dream and turn them into a marching army who would face the impossible. He has the ability to call leader after leader and place them in faith to continue the dream. He has the ability to turn an ordinary pastor and an ordinary congregation into a faith-filled, relentless, spirit-led, fearless group of people who would neither give up or quit because of the dream. Satan has fought through sickness, the Great Depression, and wars and loss of lives. He has convinced some to change sides But for those who have remained on the side of the Lord, they have experienced great great days where the dream would not, no, 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 it could not die. So today, you, his church, you have decided that you will push back the very gates of hell. You have decided that you are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. You have decided that you are the head and not the tail. You have decided that the power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that lives inside of you, and nothing, and I mean nothing, will stop his church. So may the favor and the blessing of God rest on you, his bride, the church. We acknowledge you have had great days. But may you have greater days as the church triumphant. God bless you. Well, Phil's got me even more fired up. (laughs) Well, hey, today, uh, as many of you may know, uh, that we have had one of the greatest pastors ever at our church for over 33 
and a half years. And Columbus, you've heard me talk about him before, but many of you maybe have not seen him before. But his name is Pastor Jim Sucra. Pastored our church, as I said, for 33 and a half years. And he's here today to come and just share a little bit about our history and what God's done while he was here. And so let's just welcome Pastor Jim as he comes today. It was the spring of 1983. Our family was in a very comfortable place pastoring the Nazarene Church in Neosho, Missouri. We had a four-year-old rambunctious blonde-headed boy and a beautiful baby girl and a wonderful group of people who loved us and we loved them. The church was growing and healthy. We were not looking to move. Then came the call from the district superintendent to ask us if we would allow our name to be presented to the church at Pittsburgh, Kansas as a possible candidate to be their next pastor. My heart jumped into my throat and everything within me groaned, oh no. (laughs) You see, we knew about that Pittsburgh church. They had just voted out their pastor, whom we considered our friends, and no, it was not Jim Sanders. (laughs) And I had said more than once, very vocally, anybody who goes to pastor that church would have to be crazy. (laughs) And somehow, Leah and I both knew what was about to happen. In fact, she even said, you might as well go to the store and get some boxes so we can start packing. Sure enough, about a month later, a caravan of pickups and a stock trailer and a church van pulled up to the parsonage in Neosho, loaded all of our earthly belongings, and we headed north to Pittsburgh. Except I remember there was one load left in the basement. Lowell Laughlin came back with his pickup with the topper. We loaded the last items, threw in our cat patches, and said goodbye to our comfort zone with this thought, oh no, it's really happening. As we think about the last hundred years of our church, don't you know there have been a lot of oh no moments in the life of the church and in the lives of the people who made up the church? The church was organized in 1920 as the result of a tent revival at Fourth and Tucker. And according to old church records, for six long weeks the battle raged hot against sin. And in that time, 346 professions of faith were given. And the church was organized with more than 100 charter members. For a denomination only 12 years old, that was quite significant. Property was purchased. And the church was built with the sweat and determination and sacrifice of its members, many of whom were still very new in their faith. Some of those charter members were still living when we moved here. I recall Nancy Cotton telling about carrying dirt from the basement in her apron as they were building the church. Think about what was going on in our country at that time. World War I ended in 1918. The Roaring 20s had begun only to be followed by great the great economic depression that started in 1929 and actually lasted until the early 40s. World War II started September the 1st, 1939 and lasted until September the 2nd, 1945. Think of how all of that affected the church, which was made up of blue collar workers, many of whom worked for the railroad. The financial strain of a still young church watching their young men go off to war, and then some that did from the church, not knowing if they would ever come back. The church faced other tragedies. On February the 10th, 1950, a group of young people were on their way to youth meeting. There were six in the car. And possibly because of the weather, the driver drove onto the railroad tracks, and a train hit them. And one boy was killed, 
the other seriously injured. One of those was an 11-year-old girl named Della Sampson, who wasn't really old enough to go, but went with her sister. She probably had the least injuries with a severely broken arm that resulted in 11 days in the hospital in Kansas City. And she was the first one to regain consciousness and had to tell the responders who all was in the car. And today we know that girl is Della Armstrong. The very next Sunday, a little boy walked out the door of the church into the street and was hit by a car and killed. Don't you know that was a terrible, oh no, time for the church? Here's what I remember. We felt the need to build a family life center if we were going to effectively minister to families and young people. And the first step was to come up with a plan to present to the church and start a building, except it wouldn't go on too well. The money just wasn't coming in. Now, I will never forget the board meeting when they decided to step out on faith and move ahead with the plans. The pastor wasn't too sold on their bold faith, but kept his mouth shut. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, when we got the foundation poured, five of our faithful giving families relocated for job situations. See, I was right. It was the only district assembly where I had to report that we didn't get all of our budgets paid. I took that very personally, and I felt myself slumping into an oh no kind of depression. And to top it off, we had already decided that along with the new facility, we would need to hire a full-time youth pastor, but there was certainly no money for that. I had already conversed with Mike Wanch about the position, what to do. And so we discussed the possibility of seeing if maybe they could just come on the weekends. And again, I will never forget the board meeting where they decided we really needed a full-time person and we would just have to trust God for the finances. Oh, no. <laughs> and Mike became our first full-time associate. He had a very positive influence on a young teen in the church named Kyle Rogers. I remember some of the concerns I had when we were looking to hire Kyle as our youth pastor. Because he was one of our kids. I didn't want him to come home and to get hurt in his home church. And we could go on and on about the oh no's of life. Not just in the life of the church. Each of you could add your own personal life experiences. Times when the cry that erupted from the depth of your soul was oh no. God, why are you doing this to us? I've got some really good information for us today, written by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, and here it is. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And when we're in the oh no phase, sometimes we have a hard time seeing ahead to God's yes, don't we? Now we can look back and see how faithful God has been. For about the first two years we were here, we had very few visitors. There were hurt feelings that needed to be healed. There was reconciliation that needed to take place. In our fall revival, we saw a deep move of God's Spirit. People who were harboring resentments began to leave their pews, and they would go to each other to ask for forgiveness. At the layman's retreat, the same thing happened. The clogged pipes were unstopped and love began to flow and we began to reach new people. About the time we lost those five families, 
A wonderful group of people from Gerard, like the Suders and the Terrys, showed up one Sunday. And Buddy said to many on their way to visit the first time, I sure hope they aren't considering a building program. <laughs> that was the Sunday we voted to build the Family Life Center. <laughs> but they came back. Others came. The finances picked up. And every oh no I felt was drowned out by the yes of God. We found a group of people who took us in and loved us, took care of us. We found people of strong faith. I'm sure not everybody was in favor of leaving the church they had sacrificed to build to relocate to a new site on West Quincy. And I'm told there were some who said, why in the world are we building such a big sanctuary? We're never going to fill it. And I think of those early members who held on through some very tough times. They deserve the credit of what we have today. And even the tragedies are stamped with God's goodness and faithfulness. Della told me she remembered that the teen who was killed in the car wreck was praying at the altar the week before. The church survived the Great Depression. It got through World War II, and it will continue to survive because it's God's deal, not ours. <clears throat> Today, I just want to thank you for taking a young pastor and his family in, making us a part of your lives, for loving faithfully and consistently. And I would just encourage you and all of us to keep loving and supporting the present staff and their families. Uh, none of us will be here for the next hundred years, but we're here today. And we are facing these uncertain times with a very great and sure hope. Amen. 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 Columbus, you see why we love this guy so much? We love this guy. Thank you so much, Jim. How am I supposed to follow that? I always have to follow you, Jim. <laughs> well, hey, you've just heard so many great things about our church this morning, and you probably, if you haven't maybe put it all together, but you've probably been thinking about this theme that's been going through all of this, and it's simply for the last hundred years, God has been, God is, and God will continue to be faithful to our church. Amen? Amen? He wants us to be faithful to him but he will be faithful to us. I think of the scripture in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where Paul is writing to Philippi, and he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to tell them to keep going and not to, not to get depressed or you know, to deal with struggle, but to just continue to be what God wants them to be. And here's what he said. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, who began the work, say that with me, who began the work, the, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished. Let's finish it together. On the day when Christ Jesus returns, God wants to finish what he started. We all know people who are great at starting things. I won't point at any of us. We're all good at starting things, but maybe not always finishing them. Let me tell you something. We serve a God that finishes what he started. We serve a God that finishes what he started. God wants to finish in you. He wants to finish in your marriage. He wants to finish in your heart. He wants to finish in your mind. He wants to finish you into what he has for you, his plans and his purposes. God has been, God is, and God will continue to be faithful, not just in this church, but around the world. And ultimately, God wants to do that in you. He sets you aside. Today, in just a little bit, not right this second, but just a little bit, we are going to issue four local minister's licenses to four college students who said yes to the tap on their shoulder from God. How awesome is that? As I mentioned earlier, and I've said this before, and, and I would continue to say it, the average lifespan of a church is 70 years and church, we are continuing to go into the best days that God has for us. And so we're so excited about that. 
We have a video today, and I want to, I didn't do it in the first service, and I needed to, but I want to say a special thank you to Steve Enoch and Ashton Henson. They have spent hours and hours and hours putting not only the testimonial video together that you're going to watch today, <clears throat> but also the longer one that we're going to be putting out in mean, just a, a few days. So let's give Steve and Ashton a hand. Thank you. Check out this video. If it were not for this church praying for me, if it were not for Jim investing in me and staying faithful to the call that God put on his life, I, I don't know where I'd be. My life was impacted beyond measure, and it really did save my life. I, I, I can't say it enough. Uh, I was lost, and the only thing that truly saved me was this church. Uh, without it, who knows where I'd be. I think what impacted me the most probably was the example of my parents and my grandparents, the godly example they had. And the godly example, you know, you hear about your Sunday school teachers and your youth leaders and your pastors and those all had positive influences on my life. I feel like it would almost be easier to talk about how Pitt Nass and Overflow and the Homestead have not affected my life um, just because everything about my life is is because of Pitt Nass and being connected in um, the community that I've become a part of through all of that. One of the ways that uh... Pittsburgh Nazarene Church has impacted the community is by spreading what we did in Pittsburgh into Girard <laughs> and uh, starting of uh, Living Faith Church in Girard. We had a great core group come from the Pittsburgh Nazarene Church. They were, they and a few other people teamed up to really relaunch the church and uh, it has become a church that uh, is healthy and makes an impact in Girard. And something that I've always loved about Pitt Naz is I always liked how it was a smaller church, but obviously we've grown throughout the years, but it still feels like a family to me. And that is something that I think is really cool. And the hospitality, the generosity that Pitt Naz has for this community, for those in need, and for those within the, the congregation that need help, that has something that's always been very inspiring, very encouraging, knowing that there is so much love and generosity and servanthood that resides in this church. When my grandparents were still alive, we had four generations coming to the Nazarene Church all together to get to raise my kids that way is an awesome thing. But also for families coming in to realize, you know, our church meets the needs of kids, meets the needs of young families, uh, empty nesters, and of, you know, elderly. Uh, we just seem to have ministries that meet all those needs. We have seen an amazing progression just from the time that we started in year one to now we're, we're getting close to our second year and we have seen God work in some amazing ways. We've seen 22 people that have come to know the Lord and that is a praise God for that. We have seen our attendance even during COVID. We've seen averaging about 100 people coming on Sunday mornings. We've opened up kids and teens on Wednesday nights in this building that we totally renovated for that purpose. And just this uh, recently on a Wednesday night, we had 23 teens there with eight salvations that night. And we've been having 15 to 20 kids there on Wednesday nights. So God is doing amazing things. We've seen baptisms. This is just the beginning of this movement of God that is taking place that we are participating with in Columbus. And we look forward to what he's gonna do next. But I think spiritually the church has been an outstanding re outreach and people know that they can know Christ, can find Christ, and the experience that Christ brings. Uh, and uh, there's many ways that we're doing it. And, uh, but I can still see in, in some of the areas people are responding to the gospel. And that's what's the most important thing. Personal uh, blessing. Coming to this church, Steve and I were the young couple. And now, I'm that older person that was there when we first came. 
And it's been such a blessing to see young people grow up, go into the ministry, serve here or serve someplace else. And it's truly a blessing to grow old in a good church. <laughs>